live stream on small business. Uh, obviously, with the changes to the situation around COVID and uh, the delay in the election, we've had to pivot our campaign slightly in the last week. So that's why we've been setting up sessions like this. Uh, and we're happy to do more if, if people are interested to talk more about our approach to, to small business. Um, and, you know, I think that's it's a good thing that politicians are being forced to pivot, frankly, with their campaign, because this is what business has to do all the time. So uh, my name is Jeff. I'm leader of TOP and an economist. And I have with me here our candidate for Nelson and entrepreneur and also our small business tax and UBI spokesperson, Matthew Pottinger. Kia ora, Matthew. Kia ora, Jeff. Nice to be here. And we're going to talk briefly about some of our policies, just to outline our, uh, our policies for small business, and then we're going to take your questions. So keen to, keen to have those coming through. But first, I just wanted to uh, get Matt to talk a little bit about, uh, about his business and, and what, what he does and how he's coping with, with COVID. So take it away, Matt. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, so um, my business started about 12 years ago now. Um, it was part of a final year uh, sort of project at the University of Canterbury, where I was studying mechatronics engineering with a few other engineers. We formed a team and um, industry had come to the university wanting us to solve an uh, industry problem. So, you know, a real world problem happened to be related to uh, paddle sports. Uh, the New Zealand Olympic team needed a way to measure power. So we worked on that for the year and then at the end of it, turned it into a business and sort of bootstrapped my way slowly, so to speak, uh, to the point where we're now based in Nelson and we manufacture most of our goods here. Um, so that involves instrumenting a, a carbon fiber paddle shaft and then sort of um, shipping it to overseas markets. So most of our customers are based overseas, whether that's in uh, North American markets or Europe or also Australia. Awesome. And how's, how's it been dealing with, I mean, I can imagine being an, an exporter and, uh, you know, how, how has COVID affected your, your business? Yeah, it's been a sort of an interesting one, kind of like two sides of the coin in a way. Um, in, in one aspect, of course, during the first lockdown, we couldn't manufacture any any goods during that time. And for a manufacturing hardware business, that sort of puts a bit of a dampener on things. When you can't actually make stuff to sell, you've got to get a, a bit creative. And so during that time, we sort of worked from home and, and did a lot of um, software, firmware-related stuff. Um, the other side of the coin too, I guess, is the Olympics got pushed out a year and that's sort of given us a few more opportunities here and there um, with the with the different sort of uh, elite level athletes sort of sort of refiguring out what they're going to do for the next 12 months and also the need for them to keep their training up. So we've sort of had some increases in sales. Um, so it's been a bit of a mixed bag. Cool. Well, that's that's good to hear. It's not all it's not all negative for you. So let's let's uh, you know briefly go through some of our key proposals for small business, which you know quite a few of them have been tweaked in light of COVID to 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 provide much more of a COVID uh, stimulus response for for small business to help us build back better. Really. So um, so first off. I know this is your favorite, uh, Matthew, the, the UBI, the universal basic income. The idea that we give everyone 250 bucks a week, it's a reform of the tax and welfare system. And we know from overseas experiments that this is great for people wanting to start up businesses. Yeah, you know, with the UBI, you, you have this runway, effectively. So with businesses, when you start one up, it's not profitable from day one, neither was my business. And so they had this sort of both a, uh, a cushion to fall on if your business fails and then you can get right back up off it. Currently, our welfare system, if you fall into it, it's a bit of a trap. It's not like a trampoline, like UBI. And then also that sort of idea of you've got that consistent $250 coming in each week and any money that you make through your business sits on top of that. So it doesn't get abated away, um, which is a very effective way to go from 
you know, having not started the business to the point where you can get yourself uh, to profitability. Nice. Obviously, a big thing we want to do is to simplify the interaction between small business and government. There's a whole lot of stuff that we can do in there, but the the key thing we're proposing off the bat is to just abolish provisional tax for small business. It's it's punitive, it's complicated, and it's just not necessary in these in these modern times. And actually, just getting rid of it would give a little bit more breathing room in terms of cash flow for small business. Absolutely. Um, you know, for those at home who aren't familiar with what provisional tax is, uh, there's a bit of an analogy, I guess, with the gig economy. Like, imagine if you you worked for the first quarter of a year and you earned X amount of dollars and thus you'd have to pay so much tax on that. Well, provisional tax sort of says, well, you made this much money then, we anticipate you'll make the same amount of money now, so we want you to pay tax as you go, almost tax before you've even earned that money. And, um, you know, that may have been true back in the day with steady, you know, full-time jobs and what have you, but, um, you know, in the modern age, businesses don't technically or don't always work that way. Sometimes you have good years and sometimes you have bad. And provisional tax can be quite crippling for a business that had a great year and then made a loss the next year. Yeah. Another uh, thought we have, uh, another theme, I guess, to our small business recovery is helping, uh, helping businesses be be greener and improve the bottom line at the same time. And one of the planks to this one is getting rid of the fringe benefit tax on low emissions vehicles. So at the moment, there, you know, things like double cab utes are already uh, fringe, free from fringe benefit tax. And we want to extend that to low emissions vehicles because obviously we're supposed to be uh, moving towards a, a low emissions economy. And the idea there is that uh, usually it's business that buys the new cars and most Kiwis buy secondhand anyway. So it'll st also stimulate the, the, the secondhand market down the, down the way. Yeah, absolutely. That one's a bit of a win-win, isn't it? Uh, do you have a company car, Matthew, run through your business? No, I do not. That's a missed opportunity, isn't it? Um, <laughs> I mean, I do have friends who have the double cab ute, uh, whether or not they need them. Hard to say, but um, certainly giving that option of, of having an electric vehicle or just low emission vehicles, having uh, being free of it, would be a good yeah. option to add to the table. Yeah, I have a couple of uncles who are farmers, and I'm just always amazed at how how their double cab utes are always so clean. <laughs> like, do they actually use it on the farm? Anyway, anyway. Um, so moving on and carrying on that theme of good for the environment and good for the back pocket. We want to give grants for the uptake of digital technology and energy and resource efficiency projects. So grants of, of 10K, uh, $10,000 for, for small businesses to uptake this technology. And we know from overseas that uh, you know, uptake of digital technology improves productivity, it improves profitability. And that energy and resource efficiency piece is all about reducing costs, which of course improves the bottom line and reduces environmental impact at the same time. I mean, I was involved in schemes like this when I was working overseas in, in the UK and Europe. They have a great return on investment and uh, the uh, business, business New Zealand has been talking about these sorts of things since 2011 with its green growth project. Seems like a no brainer. And then heading back to that, the cloud services aspect, right? Um, Zero was it commissioned a report that found that if 20% of businesses increased their their uptake of cloud services, that we could grow GDP by up to six billion. Um, so you know, there's there's a lot of potential there. Um, you know, increases in productivity if we can support the businesses in the right way, almost like a, a hand up rather than a hand out. That's right, and it, it's all about working smarter rather than working harder. That's, that's, what, it's, that's what it all comes down to. Um, reining in big business is another big, a big theme there. We've got, a, we've got some real problems with competition policy in this country, which allows bigger business to predate, to predate on smaller business, and we want to sort that out. But again, the, the uh, you know, most easy thing that we can do around there is just making sure big businesses pay on time and just, you know, 
uh, at the at the moment, uh, it's it's quite incredible that some big businesses yeah. are, are using. Um, is that? That is only scary in the movie. Are you having a visitor, Matthew, or is that someone else? <laughs> that was somebody else in the call. Um, oh, okay, all right. Yeah. I thought that might have been your your kid. <laughs> um, but it's quite incredible that big business uses small business as as a as an ATM machine, really, as a bank. Um, you know. Giving giving them a, a line of credit, which is absolutely crazy. Some big businesses take up to ninety days to pay. We're going to get rid of that. Completely agree. Yeah. Um, you got any any reluctant payers there, Matthew? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, no. No. Oh, okay. Well, no, that okay. might I might maybe some of my custom or my. I might be the reluctant payer. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, true, true. <laughs> And lastly, that we want to encourage productive investment. And this is all about getting rid of the loophole in our tax system, which of course is around uh, property. And you know, just because of the difference between the tax rates on property versus the tax rates on business, it creates this incentive to invest in property rather than business. And as a result, New Zealand has some of the highest investment rates in property in the Western world and some of the lowest investment rates in business. And so, you know, by, by closing that leap, loophole, by, by bringing those tax rates uh, and, you know, aligned, not only uh, can we hopefully bring down some of those uh, business tax rates, but we can also drive more investment into business. Yeah. And, and like, there's a, there's a story here too for the next generation of entrepreneurs. If we don't actually get the cost of housing under control, we're really sort of limiting their potential. Uh, for example, for me, um, buying a piece of land and putting my money into that instead of the business sort of stops its growth to some extent. And of course, the reason I bought a piece of land was to put a, a roof over my family's head. So there's just these sort of really uh, systemic issues that we do want to address. And if we can deal to the root cause with the tax system, um, I think we're going to allow the pathway for the next generation of entrepreneurs to sort of clear the way for them to, if they want to start a business young, that they're not forced to necessarily do something else with their career purely to um, keep up with the high cost of living. Yeah, yeah. And the last part of our small business package, uh, which came through in our innovation policy, which was recently released, is around making universities and politics much more responsive to the needs of small business. Of course, a big part of that is on the skills side, um, but also on the, you know, helping small businesses actually solve their problems. And what we want to do there is get rid of the, uh, the what's called the, the PBRF, the Performance Based Research Fund, which funds universities to do ivory tower type thinking to get, to, to get uh, you know, their research published in journals and actually say, well, we're going to reward you if you work with small businesses to solve their problems. Uh, so that's very much the, the idea of, of that particular reform. And I think, I mean, obviously, given the genesis of your business, Matthew, you can relate quite a lot to that, that particular idea. Absolutely. And, you know, not to tell the same story again, even um, a few couple of years ago, we had a student work here over the summer. And just the amount of stuff and the sort of expertise that they can pick up in such a short time by actually working in the business, actually getting those practical skills um, are just invaluable for their careers. So there definitely needs, there's a bit of a disconnect at the moment and we need to really tighten those two together where you've got Polytech with the students who want to learn the stuff and the businesses who need the, the talent with the, the skills. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, to, to be fair, some, some polytechs are doing this sort of stuff reasonably well, but the universities are, are quite a long way behind. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hey, so that's, that's a, a, a very brief run through what, what we're proposing for small business. Now we're keen to take your questions. We've got a couple that have already come through. Uh, so why don't, we, why don't we start there while people are, are thinking about their questions. First one from... Vaughan, scrapping provisional tax is hands down the best SME policy across all parties at this moment. Act are close, making it voluntary, but scrapping is the best. The SME sector must have an advocacy model that includes real life people from the SME coalface. The current advocacy structure is pretty much old fashioned bureaucracy. Will top support the establishment of a small business leadership panel to orchestrate key communications from the coalface 
to the beehive. Uh, look, absolutely, Vaughan, I'm 100% behind you there. And, you know, this is the problem with the kind of working group model that the government uses, and then it handpicks people who, who get on there. We actually need to in, invest in building a real voice for, for the, the small business sector and making sure that the people that are involved actually have real hands-on experience. Any thoughts there, Matthew? Um, just, I mean, I took part in the innovation debate up in Wellington a couple of weeks ago with the, you know, innovation spokespeople from the different parties. And it, it, there's a certain, it spoke volume that I was the only person there who runs a business. I was the only person there who's an entrepreneur. And it was kind of telling um, that I guess the politicians we have at the moment are sort of stuck in a very bureaucratic mode and, and I think we could really benefit with a bit of fresh air and a bit of sort of a bit more risk taking going on, a bit more sort of entrepreneurial spirit um, and that kind of voice at the table. But then when you when you look at the amount of properties that MPs own, they're certainly, <laughs> they're certainly experienced in that area. <laughs> anyway, let's not go down that route. Okay, does, does anyone else have a question that they want to ask? Any, we've got another comment from uh, John here. Uh, and the, anecdotally, in the past few months, New Zealand is continuing to head to the safe haven of property investment with any spare cash. Certainly an issue from our experience as an early stage business seeking growth capital. And frankly, why would you do anything else? Not only are you favoured through the tax system, but interest rates just keep heading down. And of course, uh, you know, banks are much more happy to lend to people for property than they are for 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 business uh, so it's a it's a, it's a real one-way street particularly when the um the uh particularly when the you know the reserve bank is really the only one doing the heavy lifting in terms of keeping the economy chugging along um yes yeah, let's let's maybe take some questions from from the social stream if there's if there's none in the yeah. room Jeff, I'm just going to unmute Vaughan. He's got a bit more to elaborate oh, on. Great. Question. Awesome. Well, no, he's still muted. Can we unmute him? Give him one second. Yes. All good? Mm -hmm. Well, you gotcha. Oh, awesome. Kia ora, Matthew. Kia ora, Jeff. How are you? You're good, thank you. Yeah, great. Hey, I just wanted to come back to that uh, question about the uh, leadership. Uh, panel. Um, I bang on, as you know, about that a fair bit. But the, one of the reasons why I think it's important to um, just expand on that a little more is if anything has shown the small business community how woefully adrift we are from the beehive, it's been COVID-19, where the people who are representing the small business community to um, uh, Parliament uh, mean well. But, but they couldn't be more uh, further up the food chain than from the coalface of small business as possible. So I guess that rather than criticise uh, what's going on in Wellington, uh, we uh, as the speed community just have to be more forthcoming. So I guess that when I say, um, will you support, it's really up to, to SME to get their backyard uh, together and uh, turn up in Wellington well orchestrated and uh, in a bit of a chorus because... Um, if we don't, well, then we just have to accept that um, uh, whether it's Michael Barnett at the Auckland Business Chamber or Kirk Hope at, at Business in New Zealand who have profiles, but they don't have a small business bone in their body. And that's not a criticism, it's just a fact. Uh, so there are, amongst the 600,000 odd people employed in or owning or operating in the small business sector, we could easily put a panel together democratically elected that can roll over and, and, and tune three yearly with the elections or whatever. Um, but I, th I personally think it's fundamental. In fact, I even make the comment when talking to other small businesses that all other policy can just go to one side until we get one face to the business as far as parliament is concerned. So I just really wanted to get that off my chest here as far as um, and, you know, it's not even from a, I, I don't care if I'm not involved with it. I think it's just, it's just would be great to see a real live SME person representing us in Wellington. Uh, kia ora Vaughan. I mean, I totally agree with what you're saying there. It, it's, and, and I hear what you're saying that it needs to come from the SME sector. I guess what I'm saying also is that, um, you know, uh, people, you know, 
people who are running and owning their own business are very rightly, you know, nose to the grindstone most of the week and probably don't have the chance to, to look up and look around at these sorts of things, which is probably yep. Yep. one of the drivers. And yep. so I think, I think government, you know, it's, it's got to come from the SME sector, but I think government's got to be in there helping and, yeah. and sh yeah. showing showing it can it can help facilitate that voice to arise, you know? Yeah. Well, just on that note, Jeff, I think that it has to be uh, almost ratified by government because if not, it will just end up being another splinter of the existing uh, small yeah. business community and we don't need another one of those. So the objective of this is to actually weave together because there is also a natural state that regionally, you know, there are chambers and business associations and whatever um, that uh, represent the small business community well and really are strong in the local area. So this is really a case of, of whatever this panel is, it would have a massive job to do to weave together that so it's presenting to government authentically on behalf rather than uh, people uh, representing themselves. Because you know, it was only two years ago we had the Small Business Council, which which created the, the Small Business Report, which is a PDF on the MB website. Yep. And um, you know that is probably a monument to where we are right now. 99.9% .9 of SMEs have never read that report, wouldn't know what's in it, and couldn't give a toss. And if you do read it, most of what's in it's not relevant to what we need right now. You know, nothing is monumental as scrapping prop tax. It'll tell you that we have too much red tape or there's other issues, but which, to be honest, most SMEs don't get out of bed every morning thinking about that. Mm. Um, and, and yeah, so, so you know, I, I think just it's almost as if it's a gift that COVID has given us. We know that this is what we need now to go forward. Mm. Yeah, cool. Yeah, nice. Great. We've got another question. Um, give me one second. We'll unmute Johnny. Kia ora, Johnny. <clears throat> Kia ora, kōrua. And uh, my, my question is just regarding thinking about changing the culture of New Zealand business that is so uh, focused now on making a profit right down to the definition of a company and thinking about whether Top has any thoughts on how to encourage or incentivize businesses to measure things other than just their financial bottom line, such as carbon footprint and well-being metrics of staff. Um, I note your cloud accounting policy and cloud software policy for businesses and wonder whether there's an opportunity there to also think about accounting um, beyond finances and what your thoughts were on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that there's, there's definitely opportunities there. Of course, it's even easier if we can put things like carbon into the bottom line, right? <laughs> I mean that's 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 the ideal, which is which is really what the uh, the emissions trading scheme is is about. If we can get that, you know, fully fully functional, and I mean I do think that uh, banks are increasingly going to want to see carbon accounting from businesses, and I think consumers will want to see that as well. Uh, so I think I think that is a you know uh, that is a, a very valid point. I mean, on the, um, I mean, just to use the example of land-based businesses and, and farming, which is which is you know mm -hmm. one of our largest small business sectors. I mean, we're definitely um, we're definitely mindful of the fact. Again, you know, we, we're coming from a from the, a background of wanting to improve the environmental footprint in, in that respect, but we have to help farmers in a holistic fashion because farmers are bombarded by on the biodiversity front, on the water front, on the climate front, there's all this different stuff that, that they're getting thrown at them. We should have one model which, which, which allows a farmer to say, this is an environmentally friendly farm. We meet this standard, you know? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, you know, it could even be different standards within that if you want a, if you want a gold standard. Um, so, I mean, I, on, you know, that's one example I think of of you know one sector of how that could be of how that could be taken forward. You got any thoughts there, Matthew? Um, no, but it did remind me of the meeting that you and I had. Remember when we when you were visiting Nelson? Uh, we met with Florence uh, Chair yeah. Sisters and talked about how their involvement with with the 50, 50 500, uh, There was a number, a huge number anyway, of trying to get that many businesses carbon zero. Uh, oh, it was a thousand, a thousand businesses a thousand. In, the Nelson, in the Nelson region, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, 
that that sort of visionary stuff you know has to be has to be supported doesn't it it's a it's a fantastic Absolutely. initiative yeah yeah um and i think uh so yeah i mean 100 percent, johnny i think i think that sort of stuff we need to be yeah businesses for climate action that's right we need to be uh in- encouraging that sort of stuff but i think it i think it has to come from uh business because you know we don't want to um you know, we don't we don't want to burden with extra regulation, uh, but I think a lot of, like I said, I think a lot of banks will want this information. I think a lot of consumers want this information. So if we can help businesses do it in the simplest way uh, and in a way that that serves them, then that's really going to really going to help. Um, yeah, it, and, and I take your point. It could be great to get carbon into into zero. I think that would be a, a, a great idea, and that's. That's kind of where we're headed with this um, idea of getting more businesses on the cloud is that we would really like to inter- integrate a lot more of uh, you know, government, um, what would now be called red tape, you know, integrate that into um, a, a seamless interface with business so that when, when businesses are employing people, they, auto- they get automatically populated uh, health and safety forms or employment contracts and stuff that they can that they can you know easily easily use to reduce that burden. So yeah, I mean there's a lot that we can do that that can help businesses do stuff um, and as you say reduce that burden. And I think I think you know clouds cloud computing offers big opportunities to do that. It sounded like a like a comment you were going to jump in with Matthew. No, that was just me shifting my shifting the weight <laughs> off my feet. <laughs> All right. Okay. Have we got um, have we got any other questions coming through? While we're waiting for questions in the room, uh, we'll take some from our social channels if you like. Yeah. Um, this was just a fun one for Matthew. Um, with three <laughs> national parks on your doorstep, is Nelson the best place in New Zealand? Oh, Patsy question. Oh, that is such mm. a Patsy question. <laughs> Let me have a think about that. <laughs> Yeah, you know what? I think it might be. I think it just <laughs> might be the best. <laughs> what are your thoughts, Jeff? Well, look, uh, I, I have to say, I mean, it is it is an incredible place. But when you describe this, the housing situation down there, I mean, it is you know that is a real that's a real crisis you got going on uh, down there, and p- particularly, I mean, it's it's eased back a bit with the um, with the you know supply of airbnb that's that's come on the market uh, but you know in an area that has you know fairly modest wages uh but house prices that are you know almost on a par with with uh you know the the likes of wellington it's it's a you know that that, that cost of living must be an incredible burden for people yeah it is and i, I think you know i've mentioned to you to this to you before this sort of idea of the canary in the coal mine the fact that you know, Nelson is feeling this stuff a lot sooner than perhaps the rest of the country in terms of having this sort of disconnect between, uh, you know, our productivity being so low, our wages being so low, therefore, and also our high cost of living. And it's sort of the way it manifests itself somewhat in this region is that we, we just have a real gap of um, people between the ages of like 18 and 30, let's say, you know, there's a real, because of a, ultimately a lack of opportunities here because you've you need to be sort of in a position where perhaps you, you're retired and therefore you've got a whole heap of cash and you want to um, retire here for the lifestyle but I think Nelson and the region has got a lot to gain from some of these smart initiatives that we've got here particularly you know the UBI and how valuable it can be for the regions yeah Thanks. yeah Thanks, Matthew. Yeah, that builds on a point actually in the room. Uh, so it was anecdotally we've seen in the past few months New Zealanders continuing to lead to the safe haven of property investment with any spare cash, which makes an issue for early stage business seeking capital. Um, I don't know if you want to comment on that, but another question that came through that was related was uh, would a UBI um, impact minimum wage? Well, the good thing about a UBI is that it kind of takes the pressure off businesses providing a, a living wage. I mean, and it's kind of, when you think about it, it's kind of crazy that we expect 
businesses to to provide a living wage uh, I, matthew's nodding his head i'll let you do this rant <laughs> uh, just just look you know the living wage is a fantastic concept and we want people to be earning the living wage and then it just becomes well let's take a step back and see what the living wage is well it's a reflection of the the cost of living you know it's based on how much is it going to cost to rent a house and food etc now the biggest driver of the living wage over the last, you know, we could go back 30 years, but we don't need to even go back that far. Let's say the last 10 years is being the cost of living. You know, we've got the most people on low incomes paying more than 40% of their income on rent. So number one in the OECD for that measure. And yet with, with house prices driving up this living wage, we're just sitting back expecting businesses to keep on making up that shortfall, you know, when myself as a business owner and a renter, I'm kind of being hit by both sides, right? You know, my rent's going up and my business, the costs of my business are going up to pay my staff a living wage. So yeah. it's about saying, is there a smarter way of doing it? And can we sort of bridge that gap and get people to the living wage some other way? And we can with the UBI and the benefit of a UBI in this case is that it's not businesses that are being burdened with that cost. That's right. Yeah, so a living uh, with the UBI, basically someone on the minimum wage gets another 6,000 per year. Uh, so they leapfrog the living wage and, uh, and uh, you know, that's without having to, to, to burden businesses. So that's simply from a reform of our, of our tax and welfare system. And really the beneficiaries from the UBI are, the, are those sort of, you know, working, what we'd call the working poor um, because, you know, the UBI gets rid of the welfare trap and makes sure that work pay, work pays. Thanks, Jeff. We've got a question in the room. I'm going to unmute Ricky. Kia ora, Ricky. Kia ora. Evening, gents. Uh, look, um, quick question. It's more or less on behalf of um, others that probably can't make the call. What's TOP's um, view in relation to the government procurement contracts that are out there? Because uh, I, it was a little while ago, there was the opportunity to, um, to keep that money in our economy, but the government chose to buy things offshore because uh, probably a, a more efficient uh, opportunity financially. But um, at, particularly at the moment, trying to keep that money in our, in our economy is going to be important. Mm. Um, there's also a view that uh, some of those contracts are probably a little bit too long, which means that there's not necessarily the provision to uh, benefit from a competitive marketplace, so people get shut out. So, yeah, mm. just interested to know what your, your views are on that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so just a clarification, Ricky, are you talking about the panel that's been set up, the the procurement panel, or are you just talking more broadly in, you know, procurement in general? Yeah, procurement in general. Okay, yeah. Um, because I, I have heard a lot of complaints about the about the panel that's been set up, the panel system, and I, I, I do think that should be scrapped. Um, but in terms of procurement in general, I think what, and again, what I've seen work uh, in overseas countries is the, is to align procurement with uh, business support. So if the government gets its act together and works out the kinds of procurement that's coming down the line through its infrastructure projects or housing projects and all that sort of stuff, and then you can aggregate that up, then you can work with local businesses to let them know that these sorts of things, are, you know, these sorts of contracts are going to be let out. So, this doesn't contravene any free trade rules because, of course, you know that that's that's kind of the, the problem you're pointing to that a lot of these contracts get get taken overseas, get taken by overseas players. But you can actually sort of tilt the playing field towards Kiwi companies by letting them know that the stuff is coming and that they can prepare for it uh, and make sure that they're in a, in a place to be able to bid for those contracts competitively when they when they come around. Um, and I think the other thing that government can do is, is encourage uh, whoever wins the contract to work with, you know, to work with local uh, SMEs in particular. You got any thoughts on, on that, Matthew? I don't know if you have any experience with government procurement. No. No. <laughs> uh, who, 
sorry, Holly, Holly, yeah. No, 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 go for it, Jeff. Oh, I was just going to ask. I mean, uh, uh, the, I mean, um, I would have thought elite sports bodies by most of your. Yeah. Well, okay. If I think about it for a bit longer, um, but yes. So, I mean, we're dealing with a lot of international uh, governments, so to speak. Um, but for us, because we're such, we're the only player in the market, it's pretty obvious who they should go with. Uh, Right, so you're literally the only provider of those. Of those, yeah. uh, oh, interesting. Okay, cool. Yeah. So, does that answer your question, Ricky? I. Uh... Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, can, I can certainly pass that information on to on to others. As I say, I was just asking on others, other people's behalf, and that they would probably have more of a, a relationship in that regard with with yeah. government or lack thereof. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Awesome. Sorry, Holly. Did you have another? Yeah, so we just got Vaughan who wanted to talk a little bit more on that, and then there's a lot of questions coming through. So, great. Take it away, Vaughan. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So just picking on because that was a great question uh, that that Ricky raised there. Uh, in terms of the government I, procurement panel, uh, so music to my ears are just like provisional tax that uh, it should be scrapped, but. The, the key thing is, is it's a challenge to the small business community to lift their game if they want to do business with the government. So, so you know, government doesn't want to be just giving it uh, to small business. But a classic example that we look at right now, and, and okay, it's local government, but it is the same thing. Um, every cobblestone in every street uh, of Auckland City is a Chinese cobblestone. Now, nothing against Chinese product, but right now, you know, wouldn't small business in Auckland love to be having that $800 million of cobblestones uh, contract, uh, you know, coming into the local economy? And I think that the other thing about the procurement uh, panel and the reason to scrap it is it's pretty offensive to the small business community to um, take tax off us and then put the money outside the country or elsewhere. Um, you know, it's almost like a customer saying to you, you buy off me, but I won't buy off you. And I, I think that the, um, the, the message to the small business community uh, right now, and for example, if you try to deal with the all of government panel, you won't get in. Um, you know, the, they have locked the gate and, and uh, thrown away the key. So, um, and that's a fact, you know, I know that for a fact. So, um, you know, there's a lot of pressure. And to be fair to Minister Nash, uh, he's looked at that about opening up and making that easier. But the easiest thing would be just draw a line through it. Mm -hmm. Kia ora, thanks, Vaughan. Great, so we had a question here. Um, what's TOP's view on expanding and electrifying rail to move product cheaply and without emissions? Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a great uh, question. I mean, and I think that is a, in, t in terms of the freight side of things, that has to be part of our investment to, to, to move to a low carbon economy. I think we have to get those rail lines uh, electrified. I mean, from a, from a big picture perspective, um, you know, there's a lot of money being spent, being, being thrown around at this election on infrastructure. And TOPS perspective is that it should be done on the basis of business cases. And that business case should should sort of look look forward uh, at the you know at, at the environmental challenges that we've got to face over the next 20, 30 years as well, moving to a to a zero carbon economy. Uh, and I think if those business cases were done, then then electrifying rail uh, for for freight in particular would would absolutely make sense. Uh, any any thoughts on that, Matthew? No. Um, just, just obviously the key point there being those cost benefit analysis, making sure that they're done to ensure that, you know, the money that we're spending is, is value for money. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, infrastructure spending really is a mess uh, in this election that's being used to buy votes and it's quite sickening. Uh, we've, we've got to get, we've got to get some business cases in there and, and, uh, you know, make sure the investment's going where it makes the most sense. Thank you. Another one was the um, the kind of innovation that makes a difference to SMEs is small I innovation, doing new stuff that confers value rather than big R and D projects. Yes. It has huge potential to improve business models and improve returns. How can politics help SMEs innovate? And that's to Matthew, but you're both welcome to answer. Oh, no, you go for it, Matthew. Ah, uh, well, I mean, uh, does this? 
I feel like there's some time here with the polytechs and uh, or our universities as well, and our innovation policy, right, Jeff, focusing on micro credentials and a kind of, well, in terms of getting people up to speed with the new skills that they might need in a quick, efficient sort of, you know, rather than doing a three year degree or what have you, um, getting getting the the employees to sort of be learning on the job in many ways or upskilling as they go. Um, and no doubt that would help unlock some of this um, innovation. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, my, my partner's just started, a, uh, you know, she's, she's retraining um, and has just started a, a three-year degree. So she's now, what is it, August? She's sort of three quarters of the way through the first year and it, she hasn't learned a single thing yet. I mean, yeah. you know, the whole... Um, the, the whole degree model is all based on bums on seats and on time spent in those seats. And it, it's, it's, not, it's not focused on what people need and it's not focused on nimble retraining. I mean, the 21st century, 15% of us are going to be made unemployed by artificial intelligence and automation in the next decade, 15% of us, and I'm not saying there's going to be widespread unemployment, there will be new jobs, but we, people are going to need to retrain quickly. We can't, we can't afford to all take three years off and, and do a new degree. Who's going to pay the mortgage in the meantime? It's crazy. So, yeah, absolutely, there's, there's some change needed there to quickly get people up to speed with, with what's happening on. And, and I think the other, the other big issue with, with the, the politics and universities is, is uh, like I said, less time writing journal articles that no one reads and more time spent with businesses making sure that they, they can uptake the latest technology, solve their problems. And our $5,000 grants are a good example of that, right? You know, a $5,000 grant is, is that sort of sweet spot for that. Let's get, let's, let's identify a small problem and tackle it rather than a huge, big, ongoing, multi-year sort of thing. And um, we can get the $5,000 pays for the student, right, from the polytech to come into the business to actually solve that problem. Yeah. And the other point of our innovation policy, I think, is to broaden, and I think this is what the question is asking, is to, to broaden the idea of innovation away from just, you know, you know, great new product ideas because New Zealand has heaps of that stuff. You know, we have some of the, uh, you know, some of the, the, the best in, in certain areas. We have, you know, some of the best R&D around, but we don't commercialize it. And that's really what needs to, what needs to happen is, is make sure that innovation uh, budget gets much more focused on actually commercializing, taking things to market so that these ideas actually get used. All right, another, you got another question there, Holly? Yep, sure, I'm just about to unmute uh, Yashelle. Yeah, g'day, Jeff. <laughs> oh, yeah, Carl. How you going, mate? <clears throat> good, good, how are you? Yeah, not too bad. I just wonder, as a, as a follow on um, fr from that theme there, in, in terms of uh, commercializing small innovations, um, in the same way that SMEs represent an, an agile component of the overall uh, commercial sector, um, I wonder what your opinion is on effectively commercialising community-raised uh, policy over the coming term. Uh, in the sense that we, you know, we have a lot of, in fact, highly qualified uh, local community groups, um, some of which I participate with in Nelson Tasman Climate Forum. Uh, you know, we've got emeritus professors and leading you know, ex-heads of NIWA, et cetera, et cetera. You know, these aren't, um, these aren't swept up dust, dust clods of people. Uh, raising some really interesting uh, policy suggestions uh, or local planning suggestions, how could that be wrapped in, do you think? <clears throat> Great question. So he's, uh, your car's down your way, Matthew. You, sh you guys should, uh, should, should link up. Yeah, indeed, we have. Oh, good, good. Um, so what I would say to that, Yakal, I mean, uh, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pretty massive question that you raise, but I think fundamentally the problem with New Zealand is that we are way too centralised. We're actually the most centralised country 
in the Western world in terms of the um, you know, number of decisions and amount of budget that is controlled by central government as opposed to our local governments. And a great example of that is around infrastructure. Local government has 40% of our infrastructure and about 7% of the revenue with which to deal with that. So no wonder we have, you know, burst water pipes and sewage pipes, that, you know, all over the country. Um, it's, a, it, it's a real issue. So TOP is really about devolving more to local areas. We should, we should let local areas have a greater in, input into the decisions that affect them, into the services that affect them. Um, and the argument against that has always been that it is expensive, that it, um, you know, it increases administration. But with, with modern technology, that doesn't need to be the case. That you, know, you can you can devolve things quite simply through uh, you know through IT systems, and you know the the other criticism is is that it leads to a postcode lottery. Well, I actually think that's fantastic. We should let local areas innovate um, because you know then people can move between local areas depending on how they're performing. So uh, you know much more of a of a um, Swiss type system of you know, local areas having much more of a, of a say over how things are done there. And you know, let, let's increase that, uh, that, that flexibility and that, um, you know, that experimentation, if you like, so, so that we can learn off each other. Any thoughts on that, Matthew, with your? I think you've covered it well. Okay. Great, thanks. We've got a question from Shaw. Uh, sure, guys. How are you going? Good, thanks, Sean. Yeah. Um, before my Wi Fi cuts out, can you get me on? Try and uh, fit in a question. Um, during the uh, lockdown, Grant Robertson talked about organic redeployment from industries that have been affected. Um, I'm one of those people, and my question is about the organic redeployment of workers um, and your thoughts about the likes of uh, the green job. Thoughts about the likes of the, sorry? I heard green jobs, so. Uh, oh, green jobs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, green jobs are uh, a, a fantastic, um, uh, and, and I think I think this is the, the, the one bit of the government's, uh, you know, COVID response package that I totally agree with, you know, because a lot of the, environmental issues such as wilding pines are in are in a lot of the same areas where people are have been made unemployed by the by the tourism industry so i think there are some some great opportunities there um, there are some questions about whether the same kind of people who work in a cafe might want to be um, out in the wilderness um, trapping stoats so that you know that that'll be interesting to see but but I do think there are uh, there are big opportunities for us in in that area. Um, the one thing that I think could be um, while we're talking green jobs, the big opportunity I think that kind of has been missed would probably be around green bonds. I mean, I think we should be doing a lot more to uh, you know in, encourage farmers to plant native trees on erosion prone land um, and. You know, of course, that's going to pay itself back in the future through through carbon credits. Uh, so, you know, we could create financial instruments that that would encourage that sort of stuff to happen wholesale now and provide a whole lot of employment in the regions. Um, instead, we're sub we we seem intent on incentivizing people to, you know, cover the landscape in pine, which I think will be a bit of an own goal um, in the in the medium term. Uh, you got any thoughts on green jobs, Matthew? No. Okay. There's a, a comment here from uh, from Anne. There is a principle. Oh, this is about the last question about localism. 
There's a principle that's used in the EU, subsidiarity, which means pushing decisions down or to the best place to make the decision. We could do with applying subsidiarity to local government in New Zealand. 100% agree, Anne. Uh, the, the issue is that uh, central government has all the power in Wellington and in New Zealand, and they don't want to share it, basically. Um, Shane Jones would much rather hold on to his budget and go around do the ribbon cutting in, in, in the provinces rather than actually share a bit of that power, which is there's, a shame. There's never been a better example of that, is there? You know, $3 million and one man tracks yeah. around the country cutting ribbons here and there. Hmm. Exactly. And and what what better example of a fund that should have been devolved to the to the regions? I mean, everything we know about regional economic development is that it should come it should be bottom up, not top down. You know, it should come from those local areas uh, and and sh it should be an organic process. So yeah, totally agree with you there, uh, Anne. We've got time for one last question, Holly. Yeah, we had um, a follow-up question from Vaughan in the room, and then hopefully one more after that. Okay. Oh, I won't take too long. I won't take too long. Um, just circling back around to the innovation chat that you had before, um, I, I think it's a real uh, diamond on the floor with the um, uh, like the AUTs and the technology institutes around the countryside that are clearly uh, tens of millions of dollars short with the loss of international students. They're a perfect uh, platform to, to be laying uh, innovation across. And when we look at the current situation, like for example, Callahan Innovation, which has got to be one of the bigger self-licking ice creams that are out there in terms of what comes out of it that's actually viable, um, I'm not too sure. And that's no criticism of uh, Vic Crane and Callahan. That's just the way that it is. We can do it better. I, I visualise like a dragon's den type situation in um, uh, the technology institutes of really driving small business through it because we're, we're not short of coming up with ideas. Um, you touched on it, Jeff. Uh, commercialisation is, is our issue. And so um, that's what we've really got to focus on. The ideas are not a problem. We spit out more of those than we can ever act on. So, so I think I just wanted to sort of make that point. So if I was, in terms of a night of scrapping things, I'm um, scrapping prov tax, um, scrapping the all government panel, and then um, let's deal with Callaghan while we're at it. Yeah, I mean, so our, our proposal is to, is to scrap PBRF in there, Vaughan, which is the, uh, yep. uh, the, the uh, you know, the current, um, <laughs> <laughs> this is a comment there from from um, from Anne, which is Callahan Innovation is a self licking ice cream. That is a meme, Vaughan. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean the the performance based research fund is probably an even bigger waste of money than than Callahan is. So that's what we're going to start with. But uh, but totally hear what you're saying there. And uh, any any thoughts on on I mean what what's your experience in working with NMIT down there, Matthew? Any uh, um, yes, to an extent. So I gave a presentation there a couple of uh, months ago that was quite good. And that's the, that's the real thing. Having gone through university myself and then seeing and being involved with the, the polytech here is just how hands-on they are uh, in compared to the university and such that they've got some system set up where they're offering me students to um, come work for me for no cost just to build up their skill sets, you know, to mm. they're really focused on that innovation, the applied innovation aspect of it all. Mm. That's great. Yeah, and I mean, that's my big concern with with the, um, you know, with the, the politics being absorbed into one, if they're all spending uh, the next few years, you know, navel gazing rather than actually engaging with their local businesses, there could be some real opportunities lost there. Um, so that's, you know, that would that would be a shame. All right, cool. so one last question, one more, Just to yeah. follow up on that. So what are your views on supporting apprenticeships to encourage the younger generation to train in areas that we know we need more workers for, targeted educational funding and employment shortfalls, rather than amounting in debt for degrees that lead to dead ends, especially wasting a first year's uni education worth of taxpayers' money when this should only pay, be paid once a student graduates to encourage full courses to be completed? 100%. Uh, I mean, I think we have uh, far too much of an emphasis on university and, and it's partly a, a cultural thing. There's almost like a cultural change that we need to, to make here. I mean, 
you know, obviously funding is a, is, is a big part of it, but as a, as a culture, we totally overvalue university degrees and undervalue a, apprenticeships. Um, but I saw you nodding furiously, Matthew, so I'll get out of the way of your rant. It's just about the sort of one path that we've created. You know, it's sort of uh, self-fulfilling or uh, it doubles down on itself, really, to say that, okay, you've, 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 you're at the end of high school, now you need to go to university. Here's the student loan that we can provide for you. Here's the, it's just here's that one size fits all pathway. And when really, you know, I often say to people, somebody could go and do a business degree for three years and no doubt they'd come out with a lot, but the same person might want to start a business off the bat and the amount of stuff that they could learn just you know, either being an apprentice to my business or just hitting the hitting the pavement themselves. We should facilitate that. We should allow for that. You know, that's one of the benefits of the UBI is that it's it makes sure that nobody falls to the cracks when it comes to which pathway they take. We the UBI doesn't care. The UBI just wants wants you to uh, do the thing that's you know take the journey that makes sense for you. Nice. Awesome, yeah, and, and I, I totally, I mean, just talking about pathways, boy, you know, compared to how easy it is to, to, to navigate your way into universities, understanding how to get into trades is an absolute nightmare. It's so confusing. I don't think we could have come up with a more confusing system than we have right now. It's, it's absolutely mind-blowing. Uh, so, yeah, I... Totally, uh, Totoko, your, your point there, Matthew. Hey, well, thanks, folks. It's nine o'clock, so uh, we'll, we'll wrap that up. But thank you so much for partaking in this session. And we're totally happy to, to, to keep doing these if, if there's the demand out there. Just, just let us know if you enjoyed it and uh, really appreciate your, your thoughtful questions and participation. Thank you, Matthew. Awesome. Thank you, Jeff. See you next time. Kakiteano.